the idea that we would become more in love with God through the fear of the Lord just almost sounds like what do you, you how do you bring fear into the picture so we'll start we'll start with this I'm going to share my screen with you for a moment and show you something I typed up that summarizes like seven conclusion statements uh, like I just threw a bunch of stuff in some notes so so I don't know if I'm going to get the notes done if not I'll just share the notes at the end but I wanted to share my conclusions at the beginning, counterintuitively. So, uh, so yeah, number one, the fear of the Lord is not fear of punishment, and it's not fear of hell. Number two, the fear of the Lord, ironically, creates fearless people. Number three, the fear of the Lord is the antidote to the fear of man, which is a form of incredible bondage. Number four, the fear of the Lord keeps us from destructive sin patterns. Number five, the fear of the Lord produces the conditions for spiritual life to flourish. Number six, the fear of the Lord jealously guards intimacy with God as our highest priority. And finally, number seven, the fear of the Lord comes with many promised divine blessings. Now, you guys already know just from hearing the list, you're, if you're like me, you're already thinking, if you're like me, you're already thinking of passages of scripture that prove each one of these points, aren't you? You're thinking, oh, the fear of the Lord is not the fear of punishment or hell because uh, God is love and the one who is made perfect in love has no fear of punishment. So if reverencing God means I'm getting closer and closer to God, then counterintuitively, the more I reverence God, the less fear is even a factor in my life. What is the fear of the Lord. Well, if the fear of the Lord is not the fear of hell and it's not the fear of punishment, then what is it? Uh, I'm going to argue that it's helpful for us to start by defining what the fear of man is. We can kind of figure out a few things from there. So what is the fear of man? Fear of man is when we care so much how others perceive of us that we live our life orbiting around other people's perception of us like the sun in our solar system. So the gravitational pull of what others think of me, how people perceive me, uh, controls my life. All my choices adjust. My, uh, my words adjust. Will people approve of my words? My actions adjust. Will they approve of my actions? My beliefs will even adjust to people's perception of me. If I think, oh, I don't know, my group doesn't want me to believe that, so I can't believe that. I won't be accepted by my group. What you like, what you dislike, your sentiments, your clothes, your culture, if all of those are changed based on what people, how people perceive you, you know you got some fear of man issues controlling your life. Now, if that's what, the, in other words, it's not really, doesn't, the fear of man doesn't feel like sitting around all day being afraid. It doesn't feel like fear at all. The closest thing I can tell is what it feels like is when they disapprove of you, you feel ashamed and worthless. In other words, the way that fear of man presents itself doesn't feel like fear, it feels like shame. It, Jesus died to strip shame off of our lives, right? He, that's like a huge factor. It's why he was stripped naked. It's why he was mocked. It's why he was flogged, because he was taking on our shame, right? And so like, to, to walk close with Jesus is to have a shame off you gospel. It's to have shame, guilt, uh, low self-worth, all this stuff stripped off of our lives and have love planted in the center. But if the fear of man is living with reference to how everyone else perceives us, so that becomes controlling of, of choices, cultures, language, and everything else, then the fear of the Lord, on the other hand, would be um, defined as we care so much about God being pleased with our choices, not, not, I'm not describing God being pleased with our person. He's already pleased with our person. We already have value. That's not under review. That's already established. But I'm talking about the fear of the Lord has to do with my choices. We want God so, to be pleased with our choices. We want it so much that, that we will reorient our life completely around, around His pleasure as our gravitational center, our sun. So we'll adjust our choices, our words, our actions, our beliefs, our likes, our dislikes, our sentiments, our culture, everything I just said for the fear of man, you replace it. And now instead of 
will people approve of me? The driving question in my life becomes, will I make God happy with my choices? Again, this is very, I chose my words really carefully here because he's already pleased with our identity. He's already pleased with who we are. He's already pleased with our value, right? Our acceptance is not what's at stake here. How much joy we bring to his face as he, as he watches us live our life, that's what's at stake here, all right? And this, this living with, with the, the smile of God, the pleasure of God at the center of our life choices, uh, the fear of the Lord, when that's in place, it pushes out the fear of man. And if the fear of man gets too strong, then while we obey Jesus, we feel horrible and worthless and confused, and we have a lot of crisis on our hands. And so the, the strange thing is, is the more, the more uh, close to the center of God's love we become, the more the fear of God frees us from the, from the fear of man. Now, I would say this, you're human if you're tempted to be controlled by the fear of man. You're human, right? You haven't failed just because you're tempted. Jesus himself was tempted in every way just like us. I bet Jesus wished people liked him who didn't. I bet Jesus wished people uh, aff- affirmed and approved of him who didn't. I'll bet it hurt his feelings a little bit that his mom and brothers thought he had lost his mind when he was actually just following Heavenly Father's calling. But he never let that, that feeling of wishing they liked him control his choices. The issue in the fear of, of, of God having that central place It doesn't mean we're never tempted by the fear of man, and it doesn't mean we're never tempted by sins. It means that ultimately we're willing to stare down those those choices and pay the price, okay? I want to throw this out there. When you start talking about a God who, who, who can be pleased and a God who can be displeased, right? We're told that we're sealed with the Spirit of God and that we're told not to grieve the Spirit of God, which means... I can, by sinning and ignoring the Holy Spirit, I can bring grief to God's heart, right? Or, by partnering with the Holy Spirit, I can bring joy to God's heart, right? I have friends who can't handle the idea that God can be pleased or displeased. They want, they want to erase their ability to affect God emotionally. And I would say that the reason is they're so scared. They, they don't believe that they're going to be able to successfully like thrive and please God. And so they'd rather just have a God who said, I'm permanently smiling because of the cross. I don't have emotions anymore. You can't displease me. You're just either in or out and you're already in. So I'm just permanently smiling. I am not responsive in any way. And I'm going, guys, first off, that isn't biblical. That's not the picture of the God you find in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. And even if you wish it were, it's not. But secondly, what it reveals to me is if you can't handle a biblical vision of a God who is emotionally responsive, what you're really revealing is is a high level of unbelief in the gospel's power to transform your motivations and heart and and enable you to live a God-pleasing life probably there's some identity issues. So instead of, instead of the fear of the Lord and you need to do this, just put that on the back burner and realize, I probably need to nail down the gospel real, like real hard. I probably need to nail down that I'm loved real hard before I even move forward. I probably need to nail down grace real hard before I move forward. In other words, you might need to stay in that infant state with that milk of grace longer if you can't handle, if, in other words, if it hasn't grown into the fullness of confidence that allows you to see the fear of the Lord as a beautiful thing. And that's okay. If you need to do that, you go ahead and do that. But don't slander the truth of the, the Bible truth that we're called to bring pleasure to his heart just be, you know, as an escape hatch from your own broken. But we do, we have a God who can be pleased and we have a God who can be grieved. And, and that doesn't, that, if that's scary to you, j- just ask the Lord about why it's scary to you. Because my, my, my sense is he is extremely easy to please and he's slow to anger. And if you know how easy to please he is and how slow to anger he is, this will not be a scary truth. This will be a comforting truth that you go, well, duh, 
I have an internal compass called the Holy Spirit, and, and he can lead me with eye contact. He doesn't even need to say a word. He can lead me with a facial expression. He doesn't even need to say a word. I, he never needs to lead the true saint with, with a bit and a bridle. He never needs to threaten. He never needs to yell. He never needs to spank. I've been told by a lot of Christians that the Lord spanked them. I've been a Christian since 1997. I've never once felt spanked by the Lord. But he does guide us with, with facial expressions. You can feel in your spirit, did what I just do not line up with, heart, with his heart? Yeah, I probably need to go apologize. I probably need to make that right. And he doesn't do a lot of yelling and spanking. He just gives me that look that says, ah, you know what I'm saying? I've had to turn my car around and go fix stuff, go back and, and feel like a fool doing it. If we still have a shame-based identity and we live under condemnation, demonic condemnation, we're going to kick back hard against this teaching of the fear of the Lord. But if we have a grace-based identity and a proper view of the Father that he is so easily pleased, like really easily pleased, and slow to anger. You actually got to try to piss God off. You got to work at it. He's not thrown off by mistakes. He's not thrown off by sins of the moment. What provokes him to anger is deliberate, repeated lifestyle choices that sow to please the flesh instead of his spirit. That's the kind of stuff that can provoke him to anger. And even then, I think you almost got to work at it to piss him off. My mom wouldn't approve of that phrase. Sorry. But again, the gospel is shame off you. The gospel is not, hey, the fear of the Lord's fear of punishment. No, no, no. It's not fear of punishment. It is reverence for the person and worth of God. It is the priority. It's that first love priority. You're first in my heart. You're first in my life. Like uh, the Ten Commandments, right? Uh, the, the, what's the first and greatest of the, of the Ten Commandments? You shall have no other gods before me, right? And here's the deal. Religiously, the idea of have no other gods means, oh, the only God I worship is Yahweh. But we all know it's possible to believe in the God of the Bible, but worship stuff, money, spouse, career, ego, image, pleasure, vacation, hobbies, as our real God, the thing that we're actually trying to draw all of our real life from, the most important thing in our life. We know that it's possible to be religiously orthodox, but to be idolatrous in our heart, right? And the, the fear of the Lord is the heart that actually God puts in us when we're born again that says, I, it, it's, it's monotheism of the heart. That's really what, what the fear of the Lord is. It's monotheism, not of the head, not of the lips, of the heart. It's where anything that tries to compete with God, we start to feel uneasy with because that, when, that's how the fear of the Lord operates. And I'm convinced that honestly, you don't even have to talk about the fear of the Lord for the Holy Spirit to just put it in people the moment they're born again. And it, it, if it's working right, if they're really saved, they want to please God. They want to know God. They want to hear God. They want to seek God. When I, when I first got saved, I didn't really know God very well, but I knew I wanted, I wanted to. And so oftentimes I experienced a lot of shame and guilt and condemnation that really wasn't coming from God. It was actually coming from how much I wanted to please God and didn't really understand how to receive grace yet. So the fear of the Lord was there, but I didn't yet understand grace. And that can be a dangerous thing. We re it's really important for us to understand God's character and God's grace. But here's the deal. We never want to get to the place where we can sin and feel good about it. If you can sin and feel good about it, you don't, you, something has broken down in your makeup. I remember when, and you can, there's Old Testament passages that talk about this where God actually is saying, let me tell you how screwed up my people have gotten. They no longer even know how to blush. They, they can steal, kill, destroy, and worship false gods, and they don't even blush. That's a serious form of brokenness, right? So in our modern world, we almost try to get rid of all, all shame. And the Bible talks about unhealthy shame. But that right there, if you are in high-handed sin, there's an appropriate godly shame that is meant to bring about repentance. 
And if and if you if we sin and sin and sin and sin and sin and disobey the Lord, we can harden our heart and sear our conscience to where the fear of the Lord is no longer functioning. And I and again, I'm not talking about fear of punishment. I'm talking about a grief that knows that you've compromised that relationship and that primacy of that and that connection. I remember when before I was a Christian, I was trying so hard to get as high as I possibly could one night, and I couldn't. No matter how much more drugs I used, I couldn't get high enough to get rid of my pain. And in the middle of that, I'm, I, I remember all of a sudden I was there with God and he just gave me a look and the look said, you know better, what are you doing? And I don't know how to describe this, so I'm, gonna use, I'm just going to use the language I have. I feel like I was blushing in real life, but I feel like my whole body and my whole soul was blushing with shame because I knew that he was right and that I did know better and that I was wasting my life. Now, it took me a lot longer than that to actually come home and start figuring this thing out. If you have fear, the fear of the Lord without a knowledge of who he really is and without a knowledge of grace, it can be crippling is really what I'm trying to say. And young Martin Luther, the reformer from the 16th century, he was studying to be a priest. And when he was trying to officiate his first communion, he pictured Jesus as like Lord of heaven and earth, grand and holy and lifted up and majestic and all power and sinless and perfect. But he also pictured Jesus as like the judge. And he had no comprehension of love. He had no comprehension of grace. He thought that Jesus saying uh, the two greatest commandments, love God and love people, he viewed those not as, as gifts that God would enable us to live. He, he viewed that as like, wow, if I don't love God perfectly today, I'm going to get judged. If I don't love people perfectly today, I'm going to get judged. So the harder he tried to love God and people, the more aware he became of how much he failed at that, and the more aware he became of his sins, and the more sure he became that God was going to judge him, and the more sure he became that God was going to judge him, the more he resented Jesus. The harder he tried to please Jesus, the more he resented Jesus, till he finally got to the point where he could admit that he hated Jesus. That's pretty freaking intense, right? So anyway, one day he was, he was training to be a priest and he was holding the body and blood of Jesus in his hands. Because if you're Catholic, that's what they believe. It's not bread and wine. It's the body and blood of Jesus. He was holding it in his hands and he had this vision of, of Christ, ruler of all the star systems and galaxies, right? Christ who is holy. Christ who every second is like holding us sinners above the pit of hell and with just, a, a, just the thought he could let go and send us to hell and we deserve it. And Luther dropped the communion bread and ran out of the, of the well, I'm going to call it a church. He ran out of the building. Because he, see, he didn't know. Later, later in life, when he renounced being a monk and he married a nun named Katie Von Bora. So hi, Katie. He married a nun named Katie, whom he treasured and had children with. And he, he loved her so much that he called the book of Galatians his Katie Von Bora. And he read the book of Galatians every single stinking week because this was a man who had the fear of the Lord in a crippling and unhealthy way, but didn't understand the grace of God, right? And, and so he knew, I got I to gotta read the book of Galatians every single week. And later Luther was talking to the young people he was pastoring and he said, oh, wow, you guys, you don't understand how amazing you have it. You get to grow up knowing Christ in all his sweetness. You get to know Jesus in all his sweetness, in his kindness, in his mercy. You get to know him in his love. He's like, I grew up knowing the wrath of a holy Christ before whom I would just cower in fear. And the kind of fear he was talking about was not this fear, not the fear of the Lord. The kind of fear he was talking about is an actual fear of punishment, condemnation, and hell. But when he understood the grace of God, themes like this just shifted for him. So in other words, we can go way, we can, if we don't understand grace, the fear of the Lord can be, whoa, not healthy. But let, you can also do the opposite. You can understand grace and not have the fear of the Lord, and it can be totally destructive as well. Brian Connolly and Adam Bauer had a close friend who could communicate the grace gospel message, the identity in Christ, that we're completely loved, that God's pleased with us, that we're completely brand new creatures, that there's no distance and no separation. They had a friend, he could communicate all this stuff. 
but he would communicate all that stuff while he was on heroin. And he said, I can do it. I, I can be, I can still, I can, I'm in, I, this stuff hasn't taken me out of God's hand. I'm still, I still feel his presence. I still feel his love. And he said that all the way till he overdosed and died. And that, that experience absolutely rocked Brian and Adam. If you, if you, you can talk to Brian Connolly or Adam Bauer about this situation and they would tell you that it marked a shift in their teaching emphasis. You will hear that in Adam, a shift to teach on the blessing and joy of obedience to God became dominant. And in Brian, the fear of the Lord message became dominant after that. Because they realized that they were, they were rightly teaching the grace message, but somehow in people's brain it got, it, got, it got turned into a license to sin. Instead of uh, an ac- grace as an access point into a covenant relationship with a God who is responsive and interactive. And if I'm responding to him, if I'm walking closely with him, he, that reverence, that fear of the Lord will actually produce incredible fruit in our lives. It will catapult us into levels of intimacy with him that are not possible without reverence. And it will actually cause us to grow in grace and grow in knowing his love in ways that will make other people around us go, I wish I knew God as a friend the way they know God as a friend. And it's actually the fear of the Lord that produces that. Let me just run down a bunch of little scriptures real quick that mention the fear of the Lord. And this is not all of them because we don't have time to go through all of them, but real fast. Acts chapter 9, then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord, and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. Deuteronomy 10, 12, now Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but this, fear the Lord your God, walk in obedience to him, love him, serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Or when the people ask Samuel, hey, give us a king. We don't want God as our king. We need a human king. Samuel was all grieved about it. And the Lord finally said, dude, you got to do it. They didn't reject you. They're rejecting me. And this is what Samuel said. He said, and as for me, far be it from me that that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. And I will teach you the way that is good and right. But be sure to fear the Lord. Be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. Yet if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will perish. So he's like saying, if you'll fear the Lord and reverence God, you're going to thrive. And, it's, and you can do this thing. But if you sin against the Lord and do whatever you want, it'll go bad for you. Uh, there's so many more I could read. Let me just see. I'm going to skip forward to one that's really beautiful here. Psalm 34, 7. I've probably prayed this over most of you at one point. The angel of the Lord and camps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Come on. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. That's a promise right there, that if you have reverence for God in your life, the presence of God, the angel of God, is resting over your household and delivering you out of every trouble. Uh, we all know these, right? Psalm or Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I'm sorry, beginning of knowledge. Or, or Proverbs 9, 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, Proverbs 10, 27, the fear of the Lord lengthens a person's life, but the days of the wicked are cut short. For, Proverbs 14, 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Isaiah 8, don't fear what these people fear. You know this one? You guys, I'm sure, have thought of it with all the conspiracy theories going around, around right now. Don't fear what these people fear. Don't call everything conspiracy. These people call conspiracy. But I'll show you who to fear. Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. Regard him as holy. Let him be your fear. And then he says, and if he is, he'll be a sanctuary for you. He'll be a stone and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling. That's interesting. So it's clearly talking about Jesus. You coming back to me, camera? There you are. And then here's an interesting one that made me think of you, Carolyn Biggs. Malachi 3.5. God says, I'm going to put you on trial and I'm going to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, perjurers, and those who defraud laborers of their wages or who oppress widows and the fatherless and deprive the foreigners among you of justice, but do not fear me. In other words, if they feared me, they would take care of widows. They would take care of the fatherless. They would take care of foreigners. They would be fair with their wages. 
they would be faithful in their marriages. I got to turn this light on. The fear of the Lord, again, is not fear of punishment. It's not fear of hell. It is a deep reverence for God and the priority of having God at the center of our lives and the idea that with our choices, we can bring joy to his, to his face. We can bring pleasure to his heart. And um, when I see believers walk in high-handed sin, the statement I m have made to my wife for many, many years is, they do not have the fear of the Lord. They do not have the fear of the Lord. They may, they may understand uh, some things about the Christian life. They may understand some things about prayer and faith and, and grace and righteousness. And we're not saved by works, but they do not have the fear of the Lord. Because the fear of the Lord is not an intellectual belief. It's a deep yearning in your gut that causes you to say, ugh, to sin. Yeah. If you want to follow up on this, if you want to read a couple books on this, Jerry Bridges wrote a book a long time ago called The Joy of Fearing God. And John Bevere wrote a much shorter book, probably a little bit theologically from a different camp. Uh, John Bevere wrote a book called The Fear of the Lord. And everything John Bevere writes is fantastic. All the way back to the beginning, let me give you the verse that captured my heart back in about 1999 and has never let go. Psalm 25, 14. The Lord confides in those who fear him, and he makes his covenant known to them. The Lord confides. Who do you confide in? And who do you tell your secrets to? Not just anybody. You confide in your closest friends, the people who have demonstrated to you over the course of a long period of time that they're worthy of your trust. The Lord hides himself from the wise and learned. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And he confides, he shares the secrets of his heart with those who fear him. And he makes his covenant known to, to, to them. There are things that God wants to reveal to those who care to take the time to treat what he said to us so far with enough seriousness that he can entrust more. He's not hiding from us. He's hiding for us. He wants to give himself. He doesn't cast his pearls before swine. I, like I said, this, this truth captured me all the way back in 1999, and it became something that I just said, oh, yes, God. I want, I want reverence for you at the center of my heart. I want to know you. I want to, have, I, want to, I want to treat your opinion as the only opinion that, that I, will, I will change all, everything out of, you know. So back to my list. I'm going to share my screen one more time just to reread these. The fear of the Lord is not the fear of punishment or hell. The fear of the Lord ironically creates fearless people. The fear of the Lord is the antidote to the fear of man. The fear of the Lord keeps us from destructive sin patterns. The fear of the Lord produces the conditions for spiritual life to flourish. The fear of the Lord jealously guards intimacy with God as our highest priority. And finally, the fear of the Lord comes with many promised divine blessings. All right, you guys can unmute your microphones and any anything.